from 1887 until the early 1990s, all of Western science was based on the principle that what happens in one place has absolutely no effect on what happens somewhere else. And now we know that this is absolutely not true. So I'd like to share with you three experiments that are absolutely shaking the foundation of, of Western physics. The first was conducted by uh, uh, a Russian physicist, Bla Vladimir Popinin, uh, in the early 1990s. He came to the United States to, to finish this series of experiments. And what Popinin did was he wanted to investigate the relationship between human DNA and the stuff our world is made out of, little packets of energy that we call photons, little particles of light, if you want to think of them that way. So the experiment consisted of taking a tube, a glass tube, uh, drawing all the air out of this tube, creating what today we call a vacuum, implying that there's nothing left in this tube. However, we know that there's still something left, these, these little particles of light. So Popinin measured the particles to see how they were distributed. Did they fly all over the place inside the tube, or were they all accumulated at the bottom, or what happened with them? And the results of this part of the experiment were not surprising because the, the little particles of light, the photons, were completely random, and this is what they expected. The next part of the experiment is where this gets really, really interesting. Because they placed some human DNA into this tube. And the human DNA, when they remeasured the photons, the human DNA had caused the photons to form an alignment. The DNA was having a direct effect on the stuff our world is made of. Now, this is precisely what ancient spiritual traditions have always said. It's something within us has an effect in the world around us. The second experiment is a fascinating experiment. It's a military experiment. And what they did, in essence, was they took some human DNA, uh, some scrapings from the tissue of inside the, of the mouth of, of a donor or a volunteer, and they placed this DNA in a device that could measure its effects in one room of a building while the donor that the DNA came from is in another room in the same building. And what they did was they subjected the volunteer to what they called emotional stimulation that would elicit genuine responses of emotion, of joy or sadness or fear or anger or rage in one part of the building. And they were measuring the DNA to see if the DNA would affect to the donor's emotions. Now, why would it? In Western physics today, there's absolutely nothing that suggests that that DNA is still linked to the donor on the one hand. And on the other hand, as they conducted these experiments, what they found was just the opposite. What they found was that when the donor was having his emotional peaks and valleys in one room, the DNA was having its emotional peaks and valleys in another room at exactly the same time. So the third experiment was conducted, again, in the early 1990s by the Institute of Heart Math, uh, a pioneering research organization uh, based in uh, Northern California. Uh, that are exploring uh, the human heart is much more than simply as a pump that moves blood through our bodies. And although the heart, our hearts do do precisely that, it may be the least of what our hearts do. They're, they're discovering that our hearts are the strongest uh, uh, magnetic field uh, in our bodies. And the electromagnetic field that is produced by our hearts has an effect that extends well beyond our bodies. So they designed an experiment uh, to, to test precisely this theory. There's no surprise, they took some human DNA and they isolated the DNA and asked individuals that were trained to feel what are called coherent human emotions, very clear emotions of love, uh, appreciation, compassion, or, or anger, rage, and hate, to have those feelings on demand. And as the people who were trained to have the feelings did so, they measured the way the DNA responded. And what they found was this. They found that in the presence of, of appreciation, love, compassion, forgiveness, the DNA became tremendously relaxed. And just the opposite is true as well. In the presence of anger, rage, hate, and jealousy, DNA was tightened like, like a little knot. Well, each of these three experiments was interesting unto itself. When you put them all together, however, Rather than being interesting, isolated experiments, they begin to tell a story. And the story looks something like this. The first experiment, Vladimir Popinin's experiment, said that the DNA in our bodies has a direct effect on our world, on the physical stuff our world is made of on the energetic level. The last experiment shows that human emotion 
has the ability to change the DNA that's having an effect on the world around us. And the middle experiment, the one that was conducted by the United States Army, shows that whether we're in the same building or 400 miles apart, the effect is the same. We're not bound by space and time. And as a matter of fact, the results of the experiments are saying precisely this, that you and I have a power within our bodies that is not bound by the laws of physics the way we understand them today. Ancient traditions not only recognized this relationship, they invite us one step further and they left precise instructions in terms of how we apply this in our lives. In the late 1980s, I was an engineer working in the defense and aerospace corporations. I began exploring these concepts as an engineer, looking in the world around me to understand the history of those who have come before us. And it is that thinking that led me into the journeys of some of the most amazing places in the world, from the temples in Egypt, from the Andes Mountains in Bolivia and Peru, uh, into India and Nepal, the highlands of central China and Tibet, all through the American desert southwest, searching for information and clues that would help us to understand how we relate to the world and how we can use this, this power of feeling, this power uh, that speaks the language, the world around us. And this is precisely what the abbot in Tibet was describing to us. He was describing a mode of prayer that's based in feeling. And he said, we must feel the feeling as if the prayer has already been answered. And in that feeling, we are speaking to the forces of creation, allowing the world to respond to us, allowing this field, the quantum hologram, the mind of God, to respond to us with what it is that we are feeling within our hearts. So, rather than praying and feeling powerless in a given situation, dear God, please let there be peace in the world. This mode of prayer invites us to feel as if we are participating in that peace. Just 1972, 24 United States cities were used to conduct an experiment where people were trained to feel the feeling of peace in a very specific manner, and they were strategically, strategically placed in these cities. Each city had populations over 10,000 people. Uh, and these were documented in some of the very well-known uh, uh, TM studies that were done. Uh, back in the, uh, in the early 70s. And what happened was, during the time that the people were feeling the feelings of peace, in the community around them, beyond the buildings where they were having their experience, the communities experienced statistically measurable reductions in crime, violent crimes against people, traffic accidents declined. Uh, in some cities like Chicago, where the stock exchanges, the stock market soared while peace was in place. And when they stopped their prayers, all those statistics reversed. And they did this time and time again. And it is so precise that we now know the statisticians were able to determine precisely the number of people that are required to kickstart, to jumpstart this kind of an effect. So I'll share the, uh, the formula, and then I'll describe what that formula means. The effect is first noticed when a certain number of people are participating. And that number, the minimum number, is the square root of 1% of a given population. So what does that mean? If you have a city of 1 million people, for example, you take 1% of 1 million on your little calculator, and then you take the square root of whatever that 1% was, and that number tells you how many people are necessary, the threshold number, to begin the effect. Obviously, the more people that participate, uh, the greater the effect. Uh, for a city of one million people, that number is only about 100. In a world of six billion people, the square root of 1% of the given population is only about 8,000 people. I had the opportunity during that time to see some video footage of the healing of a three-inch diameter bladder cancer inside the body of a woman who by medical, Western medical standards had been diagnosed inoperable. She had gone as a last resort to a medicineless hospital in Beijing, China. So in the video documentation, the film shows a woman lying on a, uh, in, in a hospital room. She's fully awake, she's fully conscious, she believes in the process that's about to happen. Before her, there is an ultrasound technician who is running an ultrasound wand over her lower abdomen that we can see on a split-screen television. And on the left-hand side of the screen, 
they do a snapshot, a freeze frame of an instant in time for reference so we can see what her condition looked like in that instant in time. On the right hand side of the screen, we are able to watch real time as three practitioners stand behind her, working with the energy in her body and with the feelings in their bodies. And what they do is they begin to chant a word that to them they've agreed upon that reinforces the feeling within them that she's already healed. The chant essentially says already healed, already done. And as they begin to, to have this feeling and to say these words among themselves, on the computer screen, on the television screen, we can watch in real time this cancerous tumor as it disappears in less than three minutes real time. It's not like time lapse on a documentary where you see a rose unfold uh, in 30 seconds and something that normally takes days. This literally happens in less than three minutes. Her body responded to the feelings of the practitioners who were trained to have the kinds of feelings that they were having. And all they were feeling was the feeling of what it feels like to be in the presence of a woman who is already healed, fully enabled, fully capacitated. They were not seeing her as a woman who was sick, and they weren't saying, bad cancer, you've got to go away. I had the opportunity to speak to the gentleman, Luke Chen, that actually created this film. And I asked him a question. I said, what if those three practitioners weren't there? So could this woman have done this? Could any of us do this on our own? And he smiled at me when I asked him the question. He said, he said, Greg, in all probability, she probably could have done it alone. However, there's something about us humans in that we seem to feel more empowered and stronger when we're supported by others in the things that we believe in and in the things that we choose to accomplish. Even more recently, the research has been done by the scientist Masaru Emoto regarding the relationship between human emotion, human feeling, and water drops is showing this relationship even more poignantly. What has happened is that these scientists, this particular research project, has discovered that droplets of water that make up over 70% of our world anyway and 70% of our bodies, that these droplets of water respond to human emotion, whether it is felt in the body or as it is actually written on labels that are placed on the vials of water and the emotion of the researcher as the labels are being written and placed onto those vials. The vials are then frozen for a, a specific period of time, removed from the freezing process, and as they begin to thaw, they crystallize. And the crystals are the telltale sign of what is happening with the emotion. very poignant example of how each of us has an opportunity to participate, not to control and manipulate, but rather participate in the events of our world, the events of our lives, our families, our communities, and our bodies through the field that links all in creation.